It's a great pleasure to welcome you to the 10 uh, in the Uhiro series in Practical Ethics. Um, I would like to thank, uh, to begin with, the Uhiro Foundation for generously sponsoring the lectures and supporting the centre, in particular the chairman, Mr. Eiji Uhiro, uh, and the vice president, Mr. Tatsuji Uhiro. Um, it's a real treat to have Professor Tim Scanlon delivering the 10th in our series. Uh, I really could have thought of no one else we would have wished to be delivering these lectures. The series title uh, is When Does Equality Matter? <coughs> Professor Scanlon uh, received his BA from Princeton and his PhD from Harvard. And in between he studied for a year at Oxford as a Fulbright Fellow. He taught for many years at Princeton before taking up a position in Harvard in 1984. <coughs> Interestingly, his dissertation and first papers were in mathematical logic, uh, where his main concern was in proof theory. But he soon made his name in ethics and political philosophy, where he developed a, a version of contractualism in the line of John Rawls, Immanuel Kant, and uh, Rousseau. Professor Scanlon has also published important work on freedom of speech, equality, tolerance, foundations of contract law, human rights, conceptions of welfare, theories of justice, as well as foundational questions concerning moral theory. His books uh, include What We Owe to Each Other, published in 1998, and The Difficulty of Tolerance, both enormously influential and important books. It's a great pr pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Scanlon to give the first lecture entitled Equal Treatment. Thank you very much, Julian. It's a great pleasure to be back in Oxford, a place uh, which has been enormously important in my life uh, for, I'm embarrassed to say, more than 50 years. Uh, of course, things have changed in Oxford, uh, many things, since I first arrived here as a first year BPhil student in 1962. Uh, and one of the nice things is the creation of the Uhiro uh, Center. Uh, so I'm particularly pleased uh, to be invited to be uh, a Uhiro lecturer. And I thank the, the foundation and Julian for the invitation and uh, Deborah Sheehan for uh, her wonderful attentiveness in uh, making all the, all the arrangements. So my topic, my topic is equality. Uh, equality is controversial. Uh, because objections to equality, or to, sorry, objections to inequality are objections to the difference between the fates of some people and the fates of others. This gives rise to the familiar charge that objections to inequality are just expressions of envy. It's easy to understand why people should wish that their own lives were better, but what reason do they have to be concerned with the difference between their lives and that of others? Demands for greater equality are, it seems to many, are just expressions of the envy that the have-nots feel toward the haves, uh, or as Nietzsche put it, resentment that the weak feel toward the strong. Given that concern with equality is a concern with the difference between what some have and what others have, it might seem that an objection is an objection to inequality rather than to something else, only if that objection wouldn't hold or would not hold as strongly if the difference between the lives of the people were reduced. Even if, they, even if this made no one better off, and at least some people perhaps even worse off. Such a move might seem pointless, and this gives rise to the famous leveling down objection, which has been much discussed of late in our academic circles. Indeed, this objection seems to be largely the older envy objection with a doctor's degree. I believe that these e objections to egalitarian claims can be answered. In order to answer them, we need to have a clearer answer to the question of why e inequality or equality matters. Why it matters that there are great inequalities in wealth, income, and other goods of life. This is what I hope to sketch in these lectures. Another reason to look for an explanation of the importance of equality is that such an explanation would put us in a better position to assess and perhaps respond to the idea that there is a fundamental conflict between equality and liberty. Robert Nozick, for example, famously charged that a concern with equality is a concern to maintain a particular pattern of distribution 
which can be maintained only by interfering with the liberty of individuals to make their own choices, take risks, and enter into contracts, which would, as a result, disrupt this pattern. Why, he asked, should we try to maintain some arbitrary pattern of distribution at the cost of constant interference with individual liberty? When the conflict between equality and liberty is put in this abstract way, equality seems immediately at a disadvantage and certain to lose. It is easy to see why interference with liberty is a bad thing. No one wants to be deprived of options that he or she values or to be told what to do by someone else. But it's much less clear what objections there are to inequality if that's just a matter of disrupting uh, some uh, preferred pattern. Now, I believe that there are a number of different reasons for objecting to inequality, and I think it's important to recognize their diverse character in order to understand their strength and when they apply. Here are a few which I will focus on as objections to economic inequality. The first is what I will call status. Caste systems and other social arrangements involving stigmatizing differences in status are leading historical examples of objectionable inequality. In these systems, members of some groups are marked as inferior, for example, by being excluded from roles and occupations that are seen as most desirable, or being required to perform tasks that are regarded as demeaning or beneath the dignity of the members of other groups. The evil involved in such arrangements is a comparative one. What's objectionable is being marked as inferior to others in a demeaning way. In the historical cases of the kind I've, I've just mentioned, inequalities are based uh, on law or entrenched social customs and attitudes. But purely economic inequalities can, I believe, be objectionable for very similar reasons. One consequence of extreme inequality in income and wealth can be that it forces the poor to live in a way that is reasonably seen as humiliating. As Adam Smith observed in The Wealth of Nations, there is a serious objection to a society in which some people are so much poorer than others that they have to live and dress in a way that they cannot go out in public without shame. Here again, the evil is comparative. It's not merely an objection to having ragged clothes or poor housing, but rather of having to live and present oneself in a way that is so far below the standard generally accepted in society that it marks one as an inferior. I will discuss this objection more fully in my next lecture. A second kind of objection to inequality is what I will call domination. Inequalities can be objectionable because they give some people an unacceptable degree of control over the lives of others. If, for example, a small number of people control almost all of the wealth in a society, this can give them an unacceptable degree of control over the lives of other citizens, over where and how they wor can work, over what they can buy, and in general, what their lives will be like. More narrowly, ownership of the public media in a country gives someone control over how others in the society view themselves, how they understand their lives, and the degree to which they understand their society. A third class of objections to inequality, again here I'm thinking of economic inequality as the thing that it is being objected to, Economic inequality can be objectionable because it undermines the fairness of basic social institutions. Here are two familiar cases. When there's great inequality in family income and wealth, individuals' prospects of success in a competitive market are greatly affected by the families into which they are born. This makes it difficult, if not impossible, to achieve anything like equality of economic opportunity. Second, Great inequalities in wealth and income undermine the fairness of political institutions in familiar ways. The wealthy will be much more able than others to gain political office themselves and much more able to influence those who hold office, who must be dependent on them for contributions and support. Thus, one reason to reduce economic inequality is that this is necessary in order to preserve the fairness both of our economic and of our political institutions. I will, I will return to the question of economic equality of opportunity in my final lecture. The three kinds of objections to economic inequality that I have just listed are all objections to the effects that differences in people's wealth or income can have. In the first two cases, status and control, these effects may make people worse off in certain respects, albeit not in the respects in which the inequality that gives rise to those effects is measured, which was money. If so, 
then the leveling down objection doesn't apply in those cases. Reducing the inequality would make some people better off in some way. They would no longer suffer status harms or be subject to objectionable control by others, even if they were not any richer. This response is basically correct, I believe, but it's not always best put as the claim that reducing inequality makes at least some people better off. In order to respond to the leveling down objection and to the charge that demands for equality are based on envy, it's not necessary, I think, to argue that reducing inequality leaves people better off. People might have good reason to object to being controlled by others, even if it, left, even if it, even if it left, did not leave them better off and even if being controlled left them better off. And this would give them some reason to object to that inequality, even if on balance, perhaps they should accept it. It's as a sacrifice they have to make uh, in order to be more comfortable. As is clear in the case of the third objection to inequality, that it undermines the fairness of economic and political institutions, the general question is whether people have good reason to object to inequality, not whether this reason that they have is based in its effects on their welfare. This response, or refiguring of the leveling down objection, leads to a further question, however, which is whether a reason for reducing inequality is itself an, is itself an egalitarian reason. If the reason for objecting to inequality has itself nothing to do with the value of equality, but, on, but only with other values, such as self-respect, control over one's life, or the fairness of our institutions, and if reducing inequality is important merely as a means to these other goods, then equality as a fundamental value seems to have, uh, have evaporated. Whether this is so or not will depend on how these objectionable effects of inequality are understood. In the case of control, for example, the answer will depend very much on whether what is objectionable in lacking control over, uh, over important aspects of one's life is a matter of being controlled by other people, that is, standing in a certain relation of subjection or domination to them, as is emphasized by writers in the Republican tradition, such as Philip Pettit, or whether the objection is simply uh, a matter of losing options that one would prefer to have. Losing options may not seem a particularly egalitarian idea, but not being dominated by others might be egalitarian uh, in itself. In the remainder of this lecture, I will consider some objections to inequality that are not, like the three I have just listed, based on its effects. One class of objectionable inequalities are cases in which an agent owes some benefit to every member of a certain group, but provides that benefit more fully to some than to others. Suppose, for example, that a municipality is obligated to provide paved streets and sanitation to all residents. It would then be objectionable if, absent some special justification, the municipality were to provide these services at a higher level to some residents than to others. For example, it would be objectionable, unjust, I would say, if the municipality were to repave streets more frequently in the rich neighborhoods than in the poor ones or more frequently in the areas where friends of the mayor or members of a certain religious group lived. I'm assuming that there is no specific level of street maintenance that the city is obligated to provide. So the level of maintenance in, in poor neighborhoods wouldn't itself be open to objection if that level were being provided to everyone. What's objectionable is not the absolute level that the, of service that the poorer people receive, in my example. What's objectionable, rather, is the difference between what's provided for some and what's provided for others to whom the same obligation is owed. Obligations to inequality of this kind presuppose, as I've said, an obligation on the part of the agent to provide the benefit in question to everyone in the group. They thus apply only where some agent has such an obligation. Consider, by contrast, at least as I think by contrast, you may disagree, the following fact. In the United States, the life expectancy for men is 74.2 years. In China, life expectancy for men is 70.4 years. In Malawi, life expectancy for men is only 37.1 years. This fact is appalling and cries out for some remediation. That is to say, the last fact about life expectancy in Malawi is appalling and cries out for, for action. But it's often awful, also often said 
that the problem here is one of inequality, sometimes called the international life expectancy gap. Now, it's a very bad thing that life expectancy in Malawi is so low, but what is the relevance of the fact that people live much longer in China and in the United States? This might be relevant simply because it indicates that human beings under modern conditions do not have to die so young. Given presently available technology, humans can live much longer than 37 years, and they do so under more favorable conditions. So one reason that the low life expectancy of men in Malawi is appalling is that it is avoidable. But referring to this situation as the international life expectancy gap suggests that the great difference in life expectancy between the three countries itself has some kind of fundamental moral significance. And it's not clear to me that it has this significance. It seems to me that in this case, what matters is just the low, avoidable life expectancy in Malawi, not the difference between it and life expectancy in other countries. The fact that people in some other countries have much greater life expectancy indicates, as I said, that the low life expectancy in Malawi is avoidable. And this directs our attention to the question of why it is so low. It might be due simply to unfortunate natural conditions, such as weather and soil. If, however, it is at least in part due to the fact that Malawians have been treated unjustly by others, then the concerns it raises would not be solely humanitarian, but also claims of justice. But this would not necessarily mean that the inequality in the, that the, inequality in the resulting situation uh, is, is what uh, is objectionable. If I am much worse off than others because someone has stolen my bank account, the objection to my situation is perhaps one of justice, but it's not at, at base one of equality. The problem is how badly I was treated, not that the result uh, leaves you uh, richer than I am. Now consider another set of figures. Life expectancy of black men in the 10 least healthy counties in the United States is 61 years. This is compared with a life expectancy of 76.4 years for white men in the 10 healthiest counties in the United States. Now in this case, the condition of those who are worse off is not nearly as bad as in Malawi. And the gap between how badly off they are and how well off others are is smaller. But the situation still seems to me morally objectionable. And it seems to me that inequality itself is more significant in this case than in the previous one. It is still true, as in the previous case, that the situation would not be made better if some new ailment reduced the life expectancy of white men. But it nonetheless also seems to me that part of what is objectionable about the situation described is the difference between the life expectancy of the white men in the wealthier counties and the black men in the poorer ones. The question that interests me is why this should be so and whether this initial reaction can be supported on reflection. The answer, I believe, lies in the fact that we suppose that the difference in life expectancy of white men and black men within various parts of the United States is due to the fact that various governmental agencies that have an obligation to provide such things as public health measures and access to medical care do not fulfill this obligation as fully for black men in the poorest counties in the United States as they do for white men in the richer counties. Now it's tempting to say, as indeed I just suggested in the previous paragraph, that the objection to the situation uh, in, uh, in Malawi um, it, it is, is shown to be non-egalitarian by the fact that this objection wouldn't be weakened if the life expectancy in the wealthier countries were suddenly to decline for some, for some outside cause. If the life expectancy in these countries were to decline, we wouldn't say, that's too bad, but at least the international life expectancy gap has been reduced. But the same is true, as I think I also just suggested, of the difference in life expectancy within the United States. If some new disease were to arise, affecting only white males, we wouldn't say that at least, although it was bad, at least it has the effect of reducing inequality in life expectancy in the United States. But, I, but in the latter case, the case of life expectancy within the United States, I do think that there is something objectionable about the gap in life expectancy, not simply about the fate of those who are worse off, whereas I don't think this holds in the former case, the Malawi case. So the leveling down test in the form in which I just used it isn't a good test for telling when a situation is objectionable on grounds of inequality. <coughs> you can't say, well, in order to tell whether it's, it's the difference that matters. We ask whether if you, if you reduced the difference, would that make things better? 
Um, I think that that doesn't actually work as a successful test. What this shows, I think, is that the egalitarian objection to the difference in life expectancy in the United States is not actually an objection simply to the fact that some people live longer than others. Rather, it's an objection to the unequal treatment that we assume in, our, in the background that we bring to, to looking at these facts is in part responsible for this difference. So we need to look more closely at the requirement of equal treatment that seems to be violated in such cases. In particular, I want to consider exactly where ideas of equality figure in this requirement of equal treatment. This will be the main topic of the rest of this lecture. The idea that the requirement of equal treatment is in fact itself not at base an egalitarian requirement might be put by saying that the demand for equal treatment is just a requirement that the agency that has this obligation should respond appropriately to the reasons it has for treating various people in certain ways, reasons generating, generated by its obligations. Insofar as this requirement of equal concern presses toward making these people actually equal in some respect, this pressure toward equality comes simply from the fact that the obligation to provide a given increase in benefit to those who have less of this benefit is stronger than the obligation to provide the same increase in benefit to those who are already being provided it at a higher level. Suppose, for example, that an agency is responsible for providing electricity or running water to certain districts. If one district is, certainly, is, is currently receiving fewer hours of electricity or running water per day than the other, then the agency, it might be said, has a stronger reason to increase the service to that district by one hour a day rather than to provide the same increase in service to the other district that's already somewhat better off. Now we can leave aside for the present purposes whether this difference in the strength of reasons is due simply to the decreasing marginal utility of these benefits to those who receive them or whether this utility is in fact the same as might perhaps be the case if the services are currently being provided at a very, very low level. And the difference in the strength of the reasons is due rather to what Martin O'Neill has called the diminishing marginal moral significance of gains of this kind. I find it often very difficult in thinking about particular examples to tell which of these seems to me to be the case. In either case, whichever, however we explain the relative strength of these reasons, uh, we could say, however we explain it, that the agency, in my example, would have a stronger reason to increase by one hour electricity or water service to the district that currently has less than, uh, th than, than it has to increase the service, the similar service uh, to uh, the, the, um, the, the neighborhood that's getting, that's getting more. So an agency that was providing these benefits unequally, when it could provide them more equally, would be, be, would be failing to respond to the stronger reasons it has. It would be responding to weaker reasons to keep up the service at the margin to the better off districts as opposed to the stronger reasons that it could satisfy or respond to instead to provide the same increase in service to those worse off. And to explain this requirement, this pressure toward equality, there would be no need to refer to any special requirement or obligation to treat people equally. I believe that this is a correct account of many, but not, I think, all cases of inequality that are objectionable on the particular ground I am now considering, the ground of unequal treatment. And it seems to me, to th this, the fact that it is, the fact that this explanation does explain many cases of this particular kind of objectionable, objectionable inequality, seems to me to explain the appeal of the view that we're all familiar with under the heading of prioritarianism, which is we don't need to worry about equality, uh, th that the, the uh, pressure toward equality is always explained uh, by the stronger claims of the worse off. But while the prioritarian view seems to me correct in the cases of the kind I've described, it, this doesn't, see, doesn't make me a prioritarian in all cases for at least three reasons. First, the phenomena I've just described and the corresponding appeal of prioritarianism arises when we are considering the obligations of some agent who has the same obligation to provide a benefit to each member of a certain group. It's thus dependent on this background obligation. Governments clearly have such obligations to their citizens in the case of many benefits, and parents to their children 
and there are no doubt many other cases of such obligations. I'm doubtful, however, that we all have such obligations to people in general. Second, so I, that doesn't make me a prioritarian in general, I, even though prioritarianism might work in many of the cases where, where we're working against this background uh, obligation. Second, the requirement of equal treatment that I've been discussing is only one source of objections to inequality, I believe. So there are other egalitarian claims that would not reduce to the greater strength of reasons to help the worse off in this way. I will, tur I will turn to some of those later. Third, as I've said, I do not think that even all cases in which inequality is objectionable because, of a, du because a duty of equal treatment is violated can be explained on the prioritarian basis. In some cases, the obligation itself has a more egalitarian character. I'm now going to explore uh, some uh, examples of this kind. To see, that, to see how this can be so, consider the obligation that a government has to provide legal representation to poor clients in civil cases. Right. Now, this case, I should immediately say, is a hybrid, uh, a hybrid of two of the sources of egalitarian pressure that I've described. On the one hand, there's a question of the fairness of the legal system. Right? If, 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 plaintiffs, if poor plaintiffs don't have adequate representation uh, and rich plaintiffs do, rich defendants do, then, then the in, un, inequality in their circumstances will undermine the fairness of the political process. So that's an example of the third kind of objection to consequences of economic inequality that I mentioned. Right? It undermines the procedural fairness of some important institution. So that's in the background of the example I'm going to discuss. But I'm discussing it instead under the heading of an obligation of equal treatment uh, because what happens in this case is that the, the, the problem that economic inequality presents a threat to the fairness of the institution, that might provide a reason to reduce the economic <coughs> inequality. That was the kind of thing I was considering when I said the fact that inequality undermines the fairness of an institution is an objection to that inequality. Right? But in a situation of that kind where economic inequality threatens the fairness of a political institution, it also gives rise perhaps to an obligation on the part of the, of the government that's maintaining the institution to provide some remediating, some, some remediating means that will, that, will, that will eliminate or respond to or deal with this inequality. And that generates a, an obligation on the part of the government, which then, then is a question of, of when is that obligation equally met with respect to all the people, all the people to whom it's owed, right? So, so this is a case of equal treatment that's, as it were, parasitic on a problem of remediating <laughs> a threat to, an inst to institutional, institutional fairness. I know this seem, probably seems pedantic, doesn't it, I mean, to make all these distinctions. But the, the, point, the point of my, this exercise uh, is to try, try to understand what seems to me the great variety of ideas that come into our thinking about when equality is objectionable. Uh, I'm trying to convince you that you will understand what's going on in these cases better if you see that there's not just one thing, e equality, which is good, but there are many different ways in which inequality can be good and e equality can be good and inequality <coughs> bad. And if we separate them, we'll be able to think more clearly about, about, the, uh, uh, about, about, the, about the cases. So that's my, that's my uh, justification uh, for what may seem uh, pedantry, but there you have it. Okay, back to the text. Uh, to, to see how there can be uh, objections to inequality that are not, uh, to unequal treatment that aren't easily reducible to the relative strength of reasons, uh, let's consider the, this, egal this egalitarian uh, uh, requirement that a government should provide <coughs> legal representation for clients in civil litigation. I believe such an obligation is, as I said, a condition for the defensibility of a legal system. A system would be unacceptable if poor defendants had no way of defending themselves against cases brought by richer plaintiffs. And I think the same is true for poor plaintiffs. Uh, sorry, for poor plaintiffs, right? A legal system isn't doing its job if, for example, poor tenants have no recourse to the courts in order to make claims against their landlords and poor people who have been injured in accidents have no effective access to the courts to seek redress for their, for their injuries. It's a, in, in political discussion about this in the United States, neither of these arguments gets very far, uh, but it, it, interestingly, the argument that poor defendants need 
need public support in order to have adequate uh, legal representation, gets, for some reason gets a lot more traction than the idea that poor plaintiffs who would like to sue somebody <laughs> uh, 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 deserve such support. But in fact, it seems to me that fair access to the legal system applies, applies, uh, applies on both sides. Given then that there is this obligation flowing from the conditions for the fairness of the legal system, there is an objection if it's fulfilled less adequately for some poor litigants than for others. So the requirement of equal treatment I've been discussing applies here just as in the case of the obligations to provide access, say, to medical care. But the interesting thing about this case is that in this case of legal representation, the particular benefit that the state is obligated to provide seems to be comparative in a further way. What's required in order for the legal system to be fair is that poor litigants not be subject to losing their cases just because rich, uh, their richer opponents are able to spend more on legal representation. This requirement might be met in various ways. For example, by constraining what richer litigants can spend, or by revising the legal process in some way so that ability to spend more makes, makes less difference. But in the absence of measures of either of these kinds, the representation that the state is obligated to provide for poor litigants has to be as good as whatever the rich can provide for themselves. The obligation is to provide effective re representation, and what is effective in the relevant sense is measured in part by what the opponents can afford to do. So here there's an interesting potential contrast, I think, with what access to justice requires for poor defendants in criminal cases. In order for a system of criminal law to be just, poor people accused of crimes must have adequate representation by defense counsel. And the state consequently has an obligation to provide public defenders or funds for them to hire private defenders. Given this obligation, equality requires that it will be filled to the same degree for all <coughs> defendants. But although this may be controversial, I am inclined to believe that there is no requirement that this representation should be as good as what rich defendants can provide for themselves. If rich defendants can afford a higher powered counsel than poor defendants, and, and this makes them much more likely to escape conviction, even if they are rich, oh, sorry, sorry, even if they are guilty. Sorry, let me start that sentence. <laughs> right, let's try it, let's take it from the top, right. If rich defendants can afford higher powered counsel than poor defendants, and this makes them much more likely to escape conviction, even if they are guilty, this is a serious defect in the system of criminal law. But it doesn't follow immediately uh, that the objection to this situation has to do with inequality. That is to say, with the difference between the likelihood of rich defendants escaping conviction and the likelihood of poorer defendants escaping conviction. If poor defendants are in fact provided with adequate legal representation, such that their chances of being wrongly convicted are very low, then the only objection to the system is that it is subject to manipulation by rich defendants who can hire such good lawyers that they can get off even if they're guilty or they're more likely to. If, on the other hand, poor defendants don't have adequate representation and so face an unacceptably high chance of wrongful conviction, then this fact is objectionable in itself as, as a ground of unfairness independent of any comparison with what happens to richer defendants. Right? So it seems to me that in the case of civil litigation, the benefit that the state has got to provide is representation for poor plaintiffs or defendants that's as good as can compete with what the rich can provide for themselves, whereas in the criminal cases, what's required is simply adequate representation. Right? So fairness of the legal system requires that poor litigants in civil cases and poor defendants in criminal cases be able to get adequate legal counsel. Each, rep each equal treatment requires that this be met to the same degree for all poor litigants and defendants, but in civil cases, but not criminal ones, what counts as adequate has a comparative, competitive con content. It must be as good as what rich litigants can provide for themselves. So fulfilling this obligation requires either supporting poorer litigants up to the level of what the richer ones can afford, or somehow limiting what the richer lit litigants can do with their money. So I conclude from this that while there are many cases in which equal treatment involves only that an agency should respond appropriately to the relative urgency of the claims of those toward whom it has this obligation, as in the case of, of, of defendants in criminal cases, 
There are other cases in which the benefit it is obligated to provide can have a comparative aspect leading to a more specific egalitarian requirement. This distinction between the two kinds of cases will be important in my third lecture when I discuss equality of opportunity and what's required in order to achieve it. I've so far considered three kinds of objections to inequality based on its effects. Objects in, in, objections involving status, domination, and institutional, un, and institutional unfairness. And I've also considered one class of cases in which inequalities are objectionable, not because of their effects, but because they arise from unequal treatment. I want now to consider one additional way in which claims to equal shares can arise, apart from the effects of these, this inequality. The difference between these claims and claims to equal treatment of the kind I've just been discussing can be seen by considering a thought experiment that Ronald Dworkin mentioned at the beginning of his book, Sovereign Virtue. The question Dworkin was imagining, uh, sorry, I skipped a sentence. Dworkin describes a man of some wealth who must decide how to distribute his estate among his several children, who have led different lives and have very different needs. The question is whether he should distribute his wealth equally or give more to the children who have greater need. I believe that the answer one is inclined to give to this question will depend on one's understanding of the claim that the children have on their father and on his wealth. If we think of these claims as arising from the father's duty to take care of his children in certain ways by providing good lives for them, then one may be led to think that the correct distribution of his wealth would be a division that takes account of the strengths of the reasons arising from the different needs of those children. This would be a matter of equal treatment of the kind I've been discussing. On the other hand, one may think that as his heirs, his children have equal claim on the family wealth. This wealth is theirs, one might say, in an equal degree. And this would lead one to favor an equal distribution. What I'm interested in now are claims to equality that arise in the second way from equal claims to a body of resources, as opposed to obligations of some <coughs> agency to treat you uh, equally uh, in some way. Claims to resources can arise in different ways. For example, if partners in a business enterprise have made the same investment of money and time, then it's plausible to say that a fair mechanism for dividing the profits should give each of them an equal share. One might say that for society as a whole, that is really like this. That is, society as a whole is a cooperative scheme for mutual benefit, in Rawls's words, and that members of a society therefore have, at least prima facie, a claim to equal shares in the benefits that their cooperation produces. Rawls's argument in the theory of justice can be seen, I think, as resting on a form of this idea as its starting point. Rawls argued that if the cooperating members of a society had to choose principles of justice without knowing their places in society, they would have no reason, initially, to accept less than equal shares. But he then argued that they would have reason to move away from this benchmark of equality, since no one could object to inequalities that didn't make them worse off, and assuming that other factors, such as basic liberties, were not affected. Leaving aside for the moment this Pareto argument for moving away from equality in ways that make everyone better off or at least no one worse off, I'm interested in the question of what justifies the choice of the benchmark of equality to begin with. Consider this question first as a question about Rawls's original position itself. The parties in this position, as Rawls defined it, are motivated solely by the aim of doing as well as they can for themselves and those they represent by the choices they make in that situation. Since the famous veil of ignorance deprives them of knowledge of their particular talents or their position in society, they have no reason to believe that any particular form of unequal distribution would make them better off. Therefore, they have no reason to choose or accept a principle allowing such a distribution based on some arbitrary factor. This would be, you might say, just taking a stab in the dark. But this explanation of why the parties in the original position should find the benchmark of equality the natural first starting point depends entirely on the way in which that original position is set up. The deeper and more interesting question 
is why a position that was set up in that way should be thought to be the appropriate way to select principles of justice that should be accepted by people in an actual society. Nozick, for example, objects that this setup begs the question against historical conceptions of justice by ruling out the claims such as those of the more talented or of people who have produced or discovered valuable resources. Part of Rawls's response, I believe, is that the parties in the original position are or represent equal members of a society seen as a cooperative enterprise. It is as cooperating members of this enterprise that they have claims to the goods that their cooperation produces. This is why the shares that he's talking about are measured in terms of primary social goods rather than in terms of benefits of some other kind. These goods are the ones that, th that their cooperation produces and to which they therefore, as producers, have such a claim. Since they are equal cooperating members, none of them has at the outset a stronger claim on these resources than anyone else. This is why, in the original position, they are symmetrically placed, leading to the initial appeal within that position of the benchmark of equality. This account of the underlying moral rationale for the benchmark of equality in Rawls's theory rests on a very controversial egalitarian claim, namely that cooperating members of a society have prima, prima facie equal claims to the benefits that this cooperation produces. Earlier, I tried to make such a claim plausible by imagining an example of the partners of a firm. But I introduced various assumptions in order to make that claim pl plausible that the partners had made the same investment of time and money, that they put in the same amount of energy, had the same ideas, and, and so on. Um, the idea that those assumptions hold in the case of a whole society are, to say the least, uh, quite, quite controversial. My purpose here is not to argue for or against Rawls's view. I've introduced this way of arriving at his benchmark of equality as an example, however, of a kind of objection to inequality that's based on an idea of equal claim to resources. It's because people have some kind of initial equal claim to these resources that they uh, would, would, should initially think that an equal distribution uh, would, be, would, would, would be favored. And this is different from the other kinds of objections to inequality that I've dis discussed, in particular different from objections to inequality based on a duty of, e of, of equal treatment. I mentioned earlier that the idea of equal treatment can in some cases support a pri prioritarian view. Rawls's view, as I've interpreted it, does not. His difference principle does require a preference for improving the conditions of those who are worse off. But this preference uh, arises not from the idea that the claims of the worse off have greater urgency, uh, uh, but, but from an e essentially egalitarian idea that they have initially equal claims to the products of their social cooperation. To summarize the discussion so far, I've identified four kinds of reasons for objecting to various forms of inequality and for seeking to eliminate or reduce them. We often have reason to reduce inequalities for essentially, sorry, First, we, we sometimes have reason to eliminate inequalities because they create humiliating differences in status. We sometimes have reason to reduce or eliminate inequalities in order to prevent those who have more from exercising unacceptable forms of control or power over those who have less. We sometimes have reason to eliminate inequalities in order to preserve the equality of starting places that's required if our institutions are to be fair. Great inequality of wealth and income can undermine equality of opportunity and the fairness of political institutions. Finally, I suggested, in some cases, just institutions must provide equal outcomes uh, because the participants in them uh, have an equal claim to the resources in some way or other uh, that those institutions are producing. Those are my four so far developed reasons for objecting to inequality. In contrast to luck egalitarian views, such as Jerry Cohen's and Richard Arneson's, which take non-voluntary inequality to be a bad thing and morally objectionable wherever it occurs, the objections to inequality that I have listed all presuppose some form of relationship or interaction between the unequal parties. Objectionable inequalities in status presuppose some relationship that makes feelings of humiliation or diminished self-esteem reasonable. Objections based on domination apply only where inequalities involve or lead to some form of control over, over some people uh, by others. 
objections based on procedural unfairness presuppose that the parties participate in or are subject to some institutions to which requirements of fairness uh, uh, apply. Objections based on failure of unequal treatment presuppose some agent or agency that is obligated to provide benefits of the kind in question, and the objection is based, uh, sorry, and objections based on an equal claim to resources that I considered finally presupposes some form of social cooperation or some other relationship that gives people some initial prima facie claim uh, of the same kind to those resources. Many of the reasons for objecting to inequality that I've discussed apply only, therefore, where there are institutions with certain obligations or institutions to which certain requirements of justice apply, such as fair equality of opportunity. This fact and my expressed skepticism about whether the international life expectancy gap is, ex is objectionable on grounds of inequality may, le may, may lead you to identify my position with the view defended by Thomas Nagel that justice applies only within the boundaries of a nation state. But my claims differ from Nagel's in important respects. First, while Nagel is a question addressing the question of when requirements of justice apply, I'm concerned only with the narrower question of when there are important reasons for some form of substantive equality. Justice may not always require e equality, and there are cases of injustice that are wrong uh, for reasons other than the inequality that results from them, as my example of theft uh, might show. Second, although some of the claims to equality that I identified presuppose institutions, Others, such as objections based on status and domination, do not propose such presuppose such institutions. And where institutions are presupposed, I don't claim that these institutions must be coextensive with or enforced by a nation state. So my view is quite different from Nagel's. But it is, an it is a view that presupposes some relationship, interaction, or institutional uh, connection in order for equality to have a claim. I conjecture, and I should emphasize, this is just a conjecture which I hope I will have given up by the end of the discussion period in this, in this lecture series. I conjecture that taken together, these reasons, of these four kinds of reasons, may provide a full account of the role that substantive equality has in our thinking. But I'm open to the argument that there are other reasons which I've not listed for favoring equality or for objecting to inequality. For example, there may be reasons for equal outcomes beyond the two that I have just mentioned. There is, for example, much current discussion of the recent increase in inequality, especially in the United States, but also to, I think, a lesser uh, extent, but still a serious extent here in Europe. And many of the objections to inequality that I've listed would apply to this famous inequality, as they say in the United States, between the 1% uh, and, and the rest. As I will say in my next lecture, I don't believe that this kind of inequality is objectionable on the ground that it creates objectionable differences in status. It may be objectionable, however, on the ground that it gives the very rich an excessive degree of control over how things go in our societies. And it's certainly objectionable because of its effects on the fairness of our political institutions. Here I would speculate, in fact, that the spectacular inequality that we've witnessed in recent decades may be as much an effect of these, uh, of, of these problems as a cause of them. While the within the financial sector, the rise in inequality may be due in large part to changes in governmental policy, such as deregulation, which, uh, so deregulation, which was due in turn to the political influence of financial interests. And the increase in the share of productivity gains going to capital rather than to labor may reflect not only market conditions, but also the pre-existing greater control that the wealthy have over corporate policies and government policies, which favor, can favor capital or favor, favor labor. If this is correct, then the recent growth of inequality is an effect of objectionable forms of political, political and economic power resulting from pre-existing inequality. And at the same time, it's also objectionable because it threatens to increase these effects. Another effect of <coughs> the extreme inequality on the political process is to skew government policy away from fulfilling the requirements of equal treatment that I discussed in this lecture. Programs to aid the poor, to provide universal health care and retirement benefits, let alone policies to keep the economy going so that the fewer people will be unemployed, are cut and undermined. And state-supported schools are also inadequately supported. 
This is due to pressure both to reduce taxes on the wealthy and also to reduce public expenditures, pre pre pressure that the wealthier segments of society are able uh, to, to mount. So a further ground for objecting to this great inequality is its effect on the possibility of achieving equality of opportunity. And I will discuss this in my third lecture. These are all serious objections to inequality based on its effects. But one gets the impression from public discussion, at least, that many people find this rising level of inequality objectionable in itself. And I find it an interesting question what objection these people have in mind, and whether it is one perhaps not included on my list. I've listed one objection to unequal outcomes as such, the one I said was represented in Rawls's difference principle. I identified its moral core as lying in the idea that the members of a society, as equal participants in a cooperative scheme for mutual advantage, have prima facie equal claim to the products of their cooperation. I myself find this idea very appealing, but as I've tried to explain, it's quite a radical uh, idea, and I don't think very many people uh, have, it, have it in mind. I somehow doubt that most of the people who object to the current uh, dramatic increase in inequality have this radical a thought in their minds. Perhaps their objection to this inequality is based on its effects, and I think there's plenty of reason to object to it based on its effects. Or perhaps what they're objecting to is not inequality, uh, but rather um, an objection to the mechanisms that generate huge incomes for executives and for people in the financial industry. They may think that these mechanisms that are generating inequality are simply illegitimate. They are forms of corruption and rent-seeking. But insofar as their objections are genuinely egalitarian, as opposed to seeing this as a form of institutionalized theft, uh, I would like to know what these objections are, so that I can consider whether I need to add them to my list. So I would appreciate your help. If those of you who have written letters to the editor or taken part in demonstrations protesting against inequality, and you were protesting against the inequality in itself, not simply because of its bad effects, uh, and the, the underlying egalitarian idea you had in mind wasn't that all of us as cooperating members of society actually have claim to an equal share of its products, but something perhaps less radical than that. I would like very much to know what it is, uh, because I feel that this is a missing piece in my thought uh, uh, about the subject. So we should bring some more of these ideas out onto the floor so that we can discuss them and assess their validity. So thanks very much. <laughs>